Ooh, look at this. So this is data coming down? This is the state of the Deep Space Network right now. It's an installation called Pulse. And it uses live data from the DSN to show data. which spacecraft we're talking to and which spacecraft are talking to us. And then the number and the speed of lights going up or down is kind of a, an interpretation of the data rate. So, so here's data going up to, to Mars. Mars Odyssey. Excellent. And that's typically about 14 kilobits per second down. Right. So but that's, uh, that acts as a relay for a lot of yes. space, a lot of stuff on the surface. So it's going to get a lot of data. So it gets, it, it's about, so it's, but it's downlinking very, very slowly. It's a, it's a very old spacecraft. Um, it takes a couple of hours for it to download just one of our relay passes. OK. Um, whereas the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is about 100 times faster. So MMS2? MMS2? The highly eccentric Earth orbiters, massively high data rates, a megabit per second and above. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. It came up with a demo at exactly the right time. Because <laughs> this also is also radiating to the spacecraft, and we're getting data back now. Yeah, but this is real time. That's yeah. the thing. That's yeah. actually what's happening. And there we go. Voyager what? one. Oh! So, so here comes the, uh, the 160 bits a second. Here we go. 160 bits per second. It'll be like there you there. go. Bing. One. There's, there's a bit. That's it. Of course, that is not the time that it takes the light pulse to reach us. There'll be another one longer than an hour. <laughs> now, some of these are to scale. This one obviously so, isn't. Is to scale. The rest are all scale models. Right. So, so this this is V'ger. <laughs> Have you tried fixing its wiring? Like yeah. this is huge. And here, of course, the box. I just uh, I got my golden record recently as well. I've been meaning to try and put together a scratch session on it. I was hoping to get DJ Kubert or something to do some scratching with the your greetings from Earth, but the stars have yet to align. There we go. Oh, and lights are coming down again. Uh-oh. But there's the camera. And yeah, the, the stage. So I could pretend to make an announcement or something from here. Yeah. We have found okay. stuff. Half, half one scale. half scale. Yeah. This for a long time was the biggest space probe in space. It was almost six tons when uh, it was you know, sent on its course. Obviously, it used its engine a lot to skip around, fly all those amazing gravity assists, and then finally fall into the atmosphere. And yeah, this is the huge, long, this is the magnetometer again, right? Yeah. And that was the big problem during uh, re-entry. They were saying if only they could have detached that, they could have kept getting signal from the whole thing for a few seconds longer, right? Because all the air pressure pushing against that was going to knock it off course. Um, down here, radio thermal isotope generator, right? There's a couple of these on this, right? It's got a, a three different sets. Yes, because something this big needed a lot of power. This, of course, was the Cassini Huygens, European built, first thing to land on uh, another outer planet. And you know this, right? That the Cassini and Huygens are the only spacecraft to have been launched towards a planetary body by a rocket named after that planetary body. <laughs> right, because it was launched on a Titan rocket and it landed on Titan. The only one, I mean, okay, so technically the Soviets had the Luna rocket, but that was really just an R7, the, you know, renamed for the Luna missions. Yeah, aerogel, what did they say, um, solidified smoke or whatever, right? Yeah, think of it as like a, a glass, a very, very light glass foam, like the yeah. best insulating material that we have ever made. It, we used it essentially as cavity wall insulation for our Mars rovers oh. to keep their electronics nice and toasty. Nice. Um, but we also used it for the Stardust mission, and we used it to, to capture comet particles. Right, because you want to have something solid that will capture the particles, but not so but, solid but that it destroys them. Yes. Yeah. Stage primary structures, multi layer insulation. That's a thermal blanket, basically, yeah. all these layers put together. This is the first um, car jack in space. This actually made the MER rover stand up. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. To make sure you can surface and <laughs> change its oil, right? Yeah. This is um, one of the radiation three motors, uh, or radial motors. Uh, 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 rocket assisted descent motors, so mm -hmm. the rad motors that fire just for opportunities slammed into the ground. Mm -hmm. 
This one's my favorite. It's a wheel for spirit and opportunity from one solid piece of what we would say aluminium. Yes, aluminium. That is the correct pronunciation. It doesn't weigh much, but uh, it's strong enough you can actually stand on it. I'm so sure. Yeah, this, this I, I'm wondering if that is, is how they want you to try it. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I did not Good thing that. it didn't break. Yes. Okay, so, so we that middle screen is the stats for the current link between Station 63 and Voyager 1. So you can see the round trip light time is more than 38 hours, almost 39 hours. Yeah. Uh, 21 billion kilometers from home. And then we're transmitting data from the spacecraft down to the Earth at, if you round that up, 160 bits per second. And we don't often talk to the Voyagers. We don't actually have much to tell them to do. They just run the same background sequence all the time. But we are currently transmitting to Voyager 1 at 16 bits per second. And the reason, of course, is that Voyager has a smaller receiver than you guys have. Yeah, mu it's, it's much, much smaller. And also, we're not using uh, X-band or K-band. We're on S-band at 2 gigahertz. So it's, it's a less efficient uh, frequency to talk to the spacecraft. So for a given amount of power, we can get less data up to the spacecraft. And then something a little, a little closer to home. Again, push, he's pushing the buttons <laughs> over here, right? So New Horizons, we're getting... 125 bits per second. That's probably one of their kind of weekly check-ins with the spacecraft. Often you'll have a spacecraft appear kind of once a week or so just to I mean, check it's in. not got any significant data. Yep. It's because it's transmitted its Pluto data and it's yep. getting ready for Mu 69. Yeah, it's in kind of a sort of quiescent cruise. Yeah. Um, although it's not a JPL mission. We downlink the data and we send it straight over right. to APL. So all the missions basically come through here yes. if they're going to be in deep space. Anything beyond, in fact, even, even some lunar missions come through here as well, but anything beyond the moon, uh, you're talking through us. Even international missions. So we will see, I mean, SOHO is a European NASA collaboration. Yeah. Um, but we will see uh, the Indian MOM, Mars Orbiter. Um, we will see uh, the Japanese uh, Venus Orbiter. Um, we will see, you know, uh, and, and no money's changing hands. What happens is we will help downlink their data and then they will share some of that data with us or we get to use one of their antennas. It's kind of, everything's kind of a trading in kind. And so the European Space Agency has a similar facility of a, of a a 34 meter antenna at three different sites around the world and sometimes we use those um, and we've actually validated that we can talk to our spacecraft with them I think one of them was listening to Cassini when it uh, when it was scuttled uh, and uh, and then sometimes those missions talk with our dishes and in the event of a spacecraft emergency something going wrong with a mission um, what will happen is uh, other missions will essentially give up their scheduled time on the dish mm -hmm. so that we can clear a pathway so that we can have constant communication with the spacecraft if it's in some sort of trouble. Right. Or trying to recover or things like that. Yeah. We're still trying to recover smart. Uh, no, it's a smart. Um, uh, stereo B. Stereo. stereo. So, so I, I, I wish I had more news on Stereo B. Uh, I think basically they're like they can still they can hear it from time to time. But they're waiting for it to rotate somewhere yes. where we can actually get um, a good signal to it. It's, it's like a very extended version of the Soho story where it was lost for, for months and uh, yes. eventually came back. I remember that. Went off axis and, uh, you know, damaged stuff. Here's Juno. Juno! Uh, 50 kilobits per second, so we're getting up there. Uh, 50 kilobits per second from Jupiter. Um, and um, now you can see it's at 8 gigahertz, so we're up in the uh, X band and, uh, rather than S band. Um, the round trip is only 1 hour 47 minutes. Let's call it a billion kilometers for, for cash, 900 and whatever oh, that is. Wow, how do you do that math in your head? <laughs> <laughs> One significant figure is all you need. And then Soho. Pretty close to home. Uh, normally it's around a quarter. Sitting at the L1 point between Earth and the Sun. There you go, 245k a second. Yep, and collecting basically solar corona, solar heliosphere data. And Odyssey just showed up on this one, so you can, there's Odyssey right now. Um, mm -hmm. Odyssey is pretty quiet, so 14 kilobits per second. MRO is up at. Uh, Depending on the Earth-Mars distance, it can be anything from about uh, half a megabit per second up to four or five megabits per second, which is pretty impressive. Um, and it needs to be for the, the, the amount of data its instruments can generate, it really needs that fast downlink. And in MAVEN, uh, it does about 300 kilobits per second for uh, a couple of hours every week. It doesn't generate a huge amount of data, and we're not using it for relay regularly yet, but at some point in the future we will. Great. That green light there, right above the door. Yeah, 
means that we're running on uh, normal mains electricity right now. Ah, I see, okay. This building. So if there was an emergency, that could change. So if it went red, it would mean we'd be using the backup power that's in this building. So we have a massive battery powered UPS. What's that? Here we go. Here comes the fake earthquake. This is the Great Californian Shakeout. JPL is joining millions of Californians <laughs> in one of the largest earthquake drills in U.S. history. Practice now so you can protect yourself during a real earthquake. This is an earthquake drill. Right now, drop cover. No, and drop hide cover. Under, hide under a chair. Oh, help, my help. My, yeah, I'm gonna try and get under here. Oh, earthquake. Earth. Right, my head is now under here. Your head is <sighs> Space flight operations That's facility. Like that? I like the sacrifices. Uh, like yeah. They think it better every year. I'm glad I was able to participate. So let's go on the floor of the dark room and then we'll go into the MSA next door. Why is it dark? Because it looks good. And I'm only half joking. It helps people concentrate. But this is what people expect from the control. Does NASA like. employ vampires? You should ask. I mean, I've I never seen them in the daylight. Let's go that far. <laughs> so, um, it does look very cool, though. It does look pretty cool. And, and really, I can't fault it for that. Oh, look, there's BB 8. So, a few years ago, um, the then lab director, Charles Amachi, um, he goes to great lengths to tell people that we've named this place after him, but he's not dead. Uh, he's still very much alive and kicking and doing great research at Caltech. One of the, the greatest scientists I've ever met, and probably the guru of using radar in planetary sciences. Um, he had some VIPs here, and he, he looked at the, the, the network, and you can see we've got data from Voyager 1, we've getting data from Juno, we're getting data from uh, interstellar space, and Mercury, and Jupiter, and Kepler looking for exoplanets, and Spitzer, an infrared observatory, and he joked and said, this is the center of the universe. <laughs> And so Jim McClure, who runs this facility, made it true. And so right down here, we have our little flag saying that this is the center of the universe. The center of the universe. Dare mighty things. I like that. <laughs> and we have little uh, stickers. I visited the center of the universe. Although, you know, to be fair, I don't think there's a lot of daring going on here. There's a lot of uh, making sure you've yes. checked your work several times. Yes. <laughs> Right. Check, check and triple check, and then have someone else check your checking. Yeah. So the, the Dare Mighty Things thing came after the Curiosity landing. Because, uh, uh, yes. The, the, it's, it's, a, it's a presidential quote, something along the lines of, it's far better to dare mighty things, even though you might fail, than to bask in the twilight that knows neither success nor defeat. That is a pretty awesome quote. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. So this is where you'd have a lot of people all working at the same time yes. so to make things happen. There is a, a measurable improvement in performance if you have your flight team and your mission manager and your flight director all in the same place at the same time, just like an orchestra and a conductor. And although in theory they could shout at each other, they're talking over loops yes. to... Yes, all the headsets. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so this room, um, you probably recognize it from the night that Curiosity landed. Lots yeah. of people in blue shirts high-fiving one another. And missing sometimes. Occasionally. We've got better at that. We've practiced now. And now we're getting ready for uh, the InSight mission. So InSight's already in here, even though we don't launch till May the 5th. Hopefully that's when the launch window opens. But between now and then, we're doing ORTs, dress rehearsals. So uh, we will have a, a machine somewhere on the lab pretend to be the spacecraft and send fake data to all of these consoles so the engineers can rehearse. They can actually run through all the procedures to make sure they know what they're doing, all the systems are going to work. And then they'll start throwing gremlins at it. So they'll say, OK, you're two days out from landing, and one of the radios doesn't work. Right. And then they have like the notebooks here with all the procedures, right? Yes. This is one right here. Yes. The, um, the worst flavor of Gremlin is when they go, OK, um, you're going to do a landing on Mars, but uh, that person, that person, and that person just got in a car crash. They're not here. Get out. And now land your spacecraft. It yeah. sounds fun. Yeah, it, it's, it's um, I mean, we, we even have operational readiness tests for NASA television broadcasts. And so we actually rode on the back of an ORT for the Curiosity landing to practice our broadcast for NASA television on landing mode. It was perfect. So we had. Alan Chen, who was um, 
one of the EDL engineers with the voice of the spacecraft, the Capcom for the night, mm -hmm. he narrated landing just like he was going to do on landing night, but with fake telemetry coming from a, a computer on the far side of the laboratory. Oh, that's, I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a practice. I go back and start again. Yeah. <laughs> um, come landing night, of course, um, in many respects, you know, there's a kind of hour-long broadcast you'll see on NASA TV. These people are just highly qualified and highly impassioned observers. There's not a great deal we can do. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, with a signal delay, there's yes. it, there's very few things that you can make a difference once it starts the terminal like a, descent. A couple of hours out is basically the last time you might normally expect to send a command to the vehicle. Um, but we will have normally a two-way signal. So we'll send a signal from the deep space network to the spacecraft because our ability to generate a frequency is better than the spacecraft's. It then turns that around and sends it back again with data on top. And that two-way signal is dramatically more accurate for ranging and range rates than just listening to the spacecraft. And so. When Curiosity was approaching Mars, the, uh, the radio antenna was off on one side of it, and the whole thing's rotating at 2 RPM. We could actually see that Doppler shift as a sine little sine wave as the spacecraft was rotating. It was amazing. And then when we went to one way, it just went to noise. Science! It works. That's awesome. Okay.